So this must be a, a fireside chat. So we have to pretend there's a fire here. Okay. We've got a couple of marshmallows. Uh -huh. You know, um, Al and I go way back. Um, we were classmates or students together in the neuroscience program at Harvard in the 80s, and we ran the uh, softball team together called the Neuroblast. <laughs> we, had, we had a bat with a neuron wrapping its axon around the bat, and we couldn't have been more nerdy, but, um, <laughs> but we did have a Nobel Prize winner at uh, third base, David yes, Hubel. Did. David Hubel, yeah. And if you go through our team, Chris Walsh, Evan Snyder, Connie Septo, was kind of a who's who in neuroscience, yet we still went to the finals. And the, uh, the animals, as they were called, they took care of the animal room. They killed us in the finals. They did. But Al was a power hitter, as you could probably imagine, <laughs> Al at bat. He hit a lot of home runs. So. And he's continuing to do so in, uh, in Farmer. So Al. Um, so let me start the basic question. Um, what are the main challenges of just taking on you know, a central nervous system disease? I mean, so many companies have been running away from neurological diseases, what is it like at Biogen in terms of taking on the challenge, not being afraid to run away? What's the corporate culture like? Like, how do you, how do you think about CNS personally and at, and at Biogen? Well, you can't be risk averse and want to do CNS drug discovery and development. Uh, in fact, many of our investors ask <laughs> us about that. Are you too uh, risk prone, essentially? But on the other hand, um, nobody argues with the unmet need, and I, and I say that the risk can be managed. So what makes drug development in CNS disorders difficult? First of all, you can't measure blood, something in the blood, and know what's going on in the brain. So we can't, it's very difficult to measure target engagement or biological changes produced by your drug. Uh, I'm always jealous of the immunologists, you know, they can just draw blood, take out lymphocytes, and look at target engagement, percent saturation, and even look at the biological changes you want. We can't do that in the brain very well. Although with CSF biomarkers and with imaging and perhaps with digital technologies, we can go some, some uh, we can do a lot better. The second is that our clinical outcome measures weren't very good. You know, we, we all grew up with the neuro exam as neurologists, and it was great uh, for localizing lesions, it's not great for following the progression of disease and therefore the treatment effect of your drug. Even C. Miller Fisher, who I learned a lot, a lot from, when we used to draw CSF out in patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus, he would say, don't do the neuro exam, time something. Measure them walking down the hall and time it to know whether or not they're improving. I also remember C. Miller Fisher holding up a ruler to an MRI and measuring the width of his third ventricle. So quantifying <laughs> imaging, and quantifying a clinical outcome measure. So, uh, so I think we're doing better with that. Um, we have experts in measurement science that are helping us with cl better clinical outcomes. I used to say we don't have enough good targets, but you know, due to the great genetics uh, from people like you and the great biologists in the room, I think we're, we have good targets. We could always use more, but um, but I, you know, that's less of a problem than it used to be, I think. Right. And then finally, the fourth problem is disease heterogeneity. Um, and, I, and I worry about that still. So, for example, we learned from other Alzheimer's trials that um, even when you have experts, 20 to 30 percent of people who come in as Alzheimer's don't, ha don't even have amyloid in the brain. Mm -hmm. But even if they have amyloid in the brain, do they really have Alzheimer's? Because anybody who sees patients in the memory disorders clinic knows that, you know, you can have DLB, for example, and have dementia with amyloid plaques. You can have Parkinson's dementia. You can have a vascular component, right? So, so I still worry about the disease heterogeneity, and obviously better biomarkers will help with that as well. So I think those, are the, those were the main challenges in the past. That was good. So, so you're executive vice president, the CMO at Biogen, but most importantly, I mean, how does it feel to be running the highest pressure trial in Alzheimer's in the world? Everyone's <laughs> looking to add you map. You got trial centers, I mean, everything from the logistics, the trial centers, and, you know, and, and, you know just uh, in terms of so many people looking for hope in Biogen. And if it doesn't work, you know, it's yeah. you. 
No, I'm already said it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Yeah, no sure. <laughs> but, but I do, you know, there is a, there's a big sense of responsibility, you know, that comes with any large phase three program for a bad disease. Um, we saw the patients, the patient up here earlier, uh, uh, interview with Mar by, by Marty Samuels, and you know, your heart goes out to the patients. Yeah. And so, you know, we had a big trial on ALS a few years ago. <coughs> Mer Merit Sukovich was the principal investigator, and it was a trial of de dextromethexol in ALS. It was a very large phase three trial. We enrolled the trial very quickly because ALS patients were uh, very hopeful about our drug, and the trial failed. And I'll never forget, it was just before Christmas, and I remember just being, I was thinking about all the patients who had hope. That's why they enrolled in the trial, and there were many more patients who we had to turn away because we had, we had stopped enrolling. And, uh, and uh, so I, if, if aducanumab fails, I think the first thing I'll think about are all the patients that we let down. Mm. Okay. And, uh, and, then I, and I would worry that, you know, e every failure in phase three makes, in, in a CNS disease, makes other companies nervous about tackling CNS disease. Right. And so I, I, I would hope that it doesn't uh, destroy the chances of other promising drugs. Um, so th those are the things that went through my mind. So when we were talking earlier with Roger Meach and Mike Cutton about the challenges of an amyloid trial, I mean, I, I think f for a long time there was confusion, even though the genetics all said amyloid is an initiator of the disease, we made the mistake of looking to mice to, to show validation. And of course, in mice, you get amyloid and find there's some inflammation and cognitive issues, but they don't get tangles. And you do those same experiments in uh, human neuroprogenitors in a 3D system like, like we did at Mass General, and then you can see if you have human neurons, not mouse neurons, mm -hmm. they make the right type of tau protein mm -hmm. with the right ratio of 4-repeat and 3-repeat tau to see tangles. So I think a lot of that debate about whether amyloid can cause tangles and actually amyloid causing tangles directly um, has, has been put to rest. But the big issue is, you know, can we still hope to stop amyloid early enough and get an outcome that the FDA will buy into? I mean, if the FDA insists that we improve cognition with an amyloid drug, um, you know, it, it's, it, again, the problem is we diagnose Alzheimer's at symptoms. It's like yeah. having a, a patient present with congestive heart failure and doing a trial of just using Lipitor and hoping that it makes the heart better. So what, with that challenge, I mean, how do you envisage, how's this going to go? Let's say aducanumab shows just enough um, significance and efficacy on the cognition while it's wiping out amyloid. Um, and now you have to think about, okay, now how do we plan? How do we plan for uh, using this drug most effectively to kind of eradicate, uh, wipe out Alzheimer's in the future? How do you do that? Yeah. Well, that's a tough problem. I mean, first of all, I think we see wonderful studies like the A4, A5 studies. I know Reza is in the uh, audience, so we see that we can st start to test these drugs presymptomatically, and my understanding is that the regulators are allowing for the use of cognitive test batteries to show efficacy. So, so you know, um, and uh, so there, there are examples of these sort of presymptomatic uh, trials, so they're already going on. But, I mean, ultimately, you know, I sometimes think about what the future will look like. And I think we're going to be considered barbarians by people 100 years from now, that we were trying to, you know, I sometimes... Well, I'd look like at our president. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were, like, like we're trying to fix a Swiss, Swiss watch with, uh, with a hammer and pliers, you know. Um, we, we use very blunt instruments as therapeutics. But it, I suspect one day we'll have, since we all have iPhones already, the iPhone will probably indicate that... We, even before we see the doctor, that we have to go and get a blood test. And then we'll get a blood test. So you're saying that in terms of early detection? Yeah. Okay, so early prediction. Well, as based. Roger said, yeah. 30 years prior to the onset of symptoms, the disease process starts. Right. And, and the, the, the idea is that there will be subtle changes that your iPhone can detect. You may not, or your, your spouse may not, but your iPhone may. Um, um, then you would get your uh, blood test, and that blood test would indicate that you have a high likelihood 
of a disease process going on in the brain. So you're saying we would we'll be, we'll be moving on beyond amyloid imaging? Then. Yeah, and then, well, I think you need, you can't do amyloid imaging in the entire population. So you have to have a way of getting, recognizing who needs the amyloid imaging or who needs the lumbar puncture. Hopefully we'll have even better tools by then. The blood test may either be definitive on its own or it may have a high sensitivity and low specificity and you may need to then go on to some sort of imaging or CSF result. And the question will be not whether or not you have Alzheimer's perhaps, but which proteinopathy do you have or complex of proteinopathies? It may be that you'll, you'll be told that you have a synucleinopathy, a tauopathy, and an amyloidopathy, or a tdp 43 opathy. Well, let's go back. You and, said, and so, uh, but you said no, not everyone can have a PET scan. So why do you say that? I mean, everyone gets a colonoscopy, and that's certainly not yeah. very easy. Well, unless they become really cheap, uh, and we can use, we have ligands that'll last more than a couple of days, because even with F18 ligands, you have to get them shipped in time. It's, it's a pretty difficult feasibility issue. CSF is much better, but then you have to get a needle in the back. Yeah. So, so unless these tests become much simpler, uh, but maintain the high degree of sensitivity and specificity, um, we're gonna have to go to those tests ultimately, but what we need is a funnel. We need a way to figure out who gets those tests um, and it may start with the iPhone. So, so the cost of the PET scan is high, but you know, couldn't, is it possible that, that that cost will come down? I'm sure the first colonoscopies yeah. were probably not cheap either. Right? Yeah, they haven't been coming down <laughs> uh, very much. And you know, I still think that, that just the shipping the ligand, having to go to a scanner, um, it's just not feasible when it's such a common disease. Um, and so, and then, and then as, as Roger was saying, I think, you know, we're not gonna wanna just treat the amyloid. And then as you're indicating, we may have to figure out, it may be too late if the tau has started to spread. So we may need to add uh, a tau agent. If they have DLB, we'll need to add a alpha-synuclein agent and, and so forth. Uh, and so we'll, we'll go from these names that we give like DLB or AD to um, a molecular diagnosis, and I think we'll treat according to the molecular diagnosis. Well, immunotherapy is not cheap, and a lot of baby boomers are heading toward risk age. So, how do you manage cost from a healthcare point of view on a relatively expensive therapy? Do you look more toward aducanumab, maybe opening the door, and then base inhibitors or GSMs coming in? Behind? Yeah, well, hopefully, there'll be an, an oral solution uh, as well. I, I didn't say it was necessarily immunotherapy. No, I, uh, but, no. um, but uh, and then the immunotherapy, um, you know, you may need to give higher doses when you have, I mean, at, at the present time, we have a brain full of amyloid. You may have to give very high doses at this point, but perhaps when you treat at a much earlier stage, you don't have to be as aggressive uh, and you can use lower doses, and you maybe you can go to sub Q versions of, of immunotherapies if we're if we have to stay with immunotherapies. But I I think uh, one day it'll be an oral. Okay. So let's say base inhibitors, right? So Merck just canceled their trial. What does that mean for your own base inhibitor you're doing with Azi? Well, we're still uh, very excited about our program with Azi. We're starting the phase three enrollment. Um, we haven't seen the data, so we don't know whether or not. There's a subgroup in there where there was more efficacy. We, I note that they're continuing their prodromal study. So I assume that means that, that uh, certainly it's safe enough to do a prodromal study. And perhaps they're seeing some evidence of efficacy in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's. I don't know, we haven't seen the data, but we'll find out. So prodromal stage can be five to seven years before MCI. Um, how do we, what about the challenge of, of, for lack of a better word, educating the FDA about lowering the bar? Um, I mean, are you concerned that, that, you know, there's A4 and A5 and, you know, we're doing earlier stage patients and there's some reason to believe from phase one that you'll still get your uh, desired uh, significance, but what if, what if it's too high a bar? What if 
blowing the amyloid at the time the disease is already full blown, the brain's degenerating, is too, is too late, even with a good um, you know, effective therapy like aducanumab or a base inhibitor. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we have to talk to the FDA and say, look, if we have a safe way to lower amyloid, let's do it? Well, the FDA, you know, I mean, we can criticize the FDA, and there are times I uh, may criticize them uh, in private, but... Um, but uh, I wasn't criticized about it. But on the Just other hand, you know, think, think, think about it. They've moved. It used to be that you, you, had both a, you, you had to have a cognitive and functional endpoint. Right. And then as we went to earlier stage disease, uh, it made no sense to have a functional endpoint requirement because they weren't functionally impaired. So now they, 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 they lifted that requirement, and now purely a pure co cognitive endpoint is good enough. And so, and then my understanding is that in these prevention trials or these pre-symptomatic trials, you can use cognitive testing. So, so I think the FDA and, and other regulators are moving in the right direction, um, and it's good to see that they're responding to data. Okay, so let's say that all works. We, we, we have some safe drugs. We can, we can detect early. We can hit early. What about physicians? How do we, is there a plan to think about how to then educate everything from the, you know, physicians to neurologists to PCPs to what, is there, have right. you been thinking about that? Well, you, you, earlier you asked what happens if the aducanumab trial fails. Right. Well, if the aducanumab trial succeeds, we're not without issues. Right. Because the healthcare system, I don't think, is ready for a drug like aducanumab. First of all, it talked about recognizing who needs aducanumab. Mm -hmm. We're not set up um, for that to happen in a, ver in a very efficient way. It's an intravenous drug. Um, are, are there enough infusion centers to right. give this drug um, once a month to hundreds of thousands of people who are gonna want, want it sooner rather than more. later? Probably more than that, right? Yeah, and that's right, yeah. millions. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, and then if, you know, um, there may be a requirement for MRI monitoring, for example. So there's a whole list of infrastructure issues, not to mention the physician. In some countries, they don't recognize MCI or prodromal. Um, and so uh, there's that whole uh, educational aspect. So, so even if the aducanumab trial is positive, which I hope it will be, um, there's a lot of work to do yet to introduce the first disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer's. Right, but I mean, health insurance companies must be thinking about this already. That um, well, they're thinking, uh, I don't know how much they are. We're start, we are starting to talk to them. We, we have started to talk to governments as well as insurance companies to prepare the way. But, um, you know, it's amazing how until the drug, they've seen so many failures that it's a little abstract still for, for many people that we talk to. Okay. So let's get back to this idea of pre-screening who might have to have um, a PET scan for amyloid rather than giving everyone a PET scan for amyloid. Um, should we have an annual, at some age, start, just start an annual wellness visit looking for cognitive changes rather than just relying on whether your yeah. iPhone gives you talking funny yeah. or something? I could, ease, I could see that perhaps if you have, uh, may, maybe you'll get a genetic risk score, mm -hmm. in which case you you have a higher likelihood of getting cognitive testing. Um, right. Could see various ways where this this would go. To me, I, I like the idea of having um, the reason why I like the iPhone idea is first of all everybody has one, and, and almost in every country I've ever been to, everybody seems to have an iPhone. And second, it it doesn't require anybody to do anything. Um, beyond their normal, uh, what they do in daily life. So, um, so and, and you, can, you get the advantage of having daily measurements. When you go to the doctor on any particular day, you may not do well on a cognitive test because you, don't, you didn't get enough sleep the night before or whatever. The advantage of having daily measurements is that you can, uh, and, and the prior uh, session was about big data, I'm sure there are ways of averaging all that information and getting as much signal as you can out of that noise. So, so that's, my, that's why I have a slight preference for that. But, um, and, and you know, after all, the iPhone is basically an interface with your brain through your fingers and your eyes. That's all it is. So it, it, would, it just stands to reason that it would detect something going on in your brain uh, very early. Right. 
So right now, Alzheimer's uh, takes You're one. You're using your iPhone now, by the way. Using everything. <laughs> um, you know, one in five dollars of Medicare and Medicaid in the United States goes to Alzheimer's disease. Um, 71 million baby boomers like us heading toward that risk age. That one in five is going to go to one in three, probably over the next decade if we don't do anything about the disease. And now Alzheimer's has a chance to single-handedly collapse healthcare and Medicare and Medicaid. Do you think the government knowing that would say, well, what is the cost of losing Medicare and Medicaid, having our healthcare collapse? What's the cost of assisted living taking care of patients? What's the toll on inner city where you know, lower income communities can't afford assisted living or stay home from their jobs? And say, you know what, it's worth figuring out a financial program to pay for a relatively expensive therapy to, to prevent this disease so we don't have to deal with the rest of it? You're asking some tough questions here. Really. I, well, you know. <laughs> but I'll say this, I remember I was a medical student during the AIDS epidemic. And I remember there was a lot of talk that the AIDS epidemic would break our economy. Um, and uh, it didn't happen. And the reason why it didn't happen is that we figured out how to uh, prevent AIDS. Now we don't even talk about AIDS, we talk about HIV positivity. And maybe, we'll, maybe, maybe that's the solution, is that we talk about amyloid positivity so we prevent Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And, uh, and, and hopefully then it won't break our economy. So let's, um, in the final minutes, moving behind, uh, moving beyond amyloid, you have uh, wisely taken Richard Ransohoff into the company, um, an expert in neuroinflammation and microglial cells. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in, in that area or will Richard kill you? I think Richard <laughs> would kill me. Um, and I think you just had a whole session on neuroinflammation, right? Right, but we don't know what you're doing. Uh. <laughs> Richard? <laughs> uh, I mean, well, CD33 has become a big target. Yeah, trend. Well, well, yeah, so I think, you know, CD33, TREM2. Um, to, to me, the whole microglial field, um, you know, the problem with these cells is that you take them out and they change as soon as you take them out of the body. Yeah. Um, I would like to understand all the various states of microglial cells in health and disease in humans and, and, and begin by trying, because when I hear words like microglial activation, or I don't even know what that means, um, activated to what state. There's different states. Yeah, and so I, I, feel, I feel like we're, at, we're just on the beginning of understanding the complexity of these cells. Uh, and then if we can get ligands that recognize the various states then we can maybe try to understand much more about fundamental aspects of microglial cells. But in the meantime, uh, TREM2 and CD33 look like good targets. How we would do the early clinical experiments to know that we've gotten the biological change we want, that's Richard's problem and yours. <laughs> now, now, you know, a AD and MS are, uh, are two of the diseases you tackle in uh, CMS. What Let's say you're successful. You, you've had success in MS. Let's say you have success in AD. We hope it works. What's, what's next? Well, I've always. What are you doing five years from now? <laughs> well, you know. I mean, at Biogen. Awesome. Well, I, I used to see uh, ALS patients at Mass General before I came to Biogen. And in fact, that's what drove me to go to Biogen was that it, it's such a terrible disease. And to have to tell people they have ALS. And on top of that, tell them that we have nothing to offer them really except chlorilazole, which is helpful, but minimally so. Um, I would love to see a solution for ALS. And uh, I know Merritt is sitting there, and I'm sure she's thinking the same thing. And it feels like we're, we're, we're gaining traction. Uh, you know, Steve Paul talked about SOD. We have a program in SOD as well. Um, for me, ALS. We can break it down into the genetic subsets, C9 ORF and otherwise, tackle it one by one, and then uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll uh, eventually uh, solve ALS uh, for the broad uh, ALS population. Well, we all thank you for your leadership and what you're doing, and thank you for being so candid in this interview. Thank you. Thank you.